So I think we want to start with the Blackwell architecture, broadly speaking, with a focus on the new SM design to start with. So this has actually seen some pretty significant overhauls relative to Ada Lovelace. Is that correct, Alex? Yeah, basically, um, they are constantly changing the SM with each generation that has happened since Turing. Uh, well, with Ada probably being the one that is the, the, the least different from its predecessor. But back when Turing launched, uh, they introduced something new where at the same time as the SM could issue and process um, a floating point 32-bit, like maths, it could also concurrently work on integer math 32-bit. And this was done back then specifically for Turing because they said they profiled a lot of games and they found that 35% of the time the GPU was working on integer math uh, uh, when also working uh, alongside the, the floating point math. And they thought we could get more performance out of the SM by allowing it to, to do it concurrently at the same time. And, you know, that 35% would mean technically like, oh, yeah, things could be completed in a shorter amount of time. That actually went away with uh, Ampere. They got rid of that feature and instead focused on uh, this dual issue floating point unit. And mm -hmm. I don't know, that's been not so interesting uh, actually, uh, we haven't really noticed, you know, the hyper infl inflated teraflops numbers really having a great bearing on scaling. It's kind of scaled as if it has just been half that number, more or less, in a lot of titles. Uh, so they're bringing this back essentially but while keeping the dual issue floating point. So it's kind of like dual issue floating point and integer uh and mm -hmm. we'll have to see over a number of titles over time but uh if it is anything like turing maybe it will have actually a positive uh influence uh on performance that goes out of step with the increase in amount of sms total versus the previous architecture but once again we'll have to see while actually doing the benchmarks in the games yeah yeah that would certainly be uh certainly be encouraging and a nice change of pace because like you said that dual issue functionality across vendors even hasn't seemed to result in much of an improvement thus far in pc graphics right but there is another uh, another aspect of this architecture that's quite interesting in that the tensor core now supports fp4 acceleration which i think is a pretty big development for a lot of machine learning workloads because it's you know, often used for quantized models where you essentially lower the precision of a model and you get better performance, you get um, better memory usage, uh, much more much more lightweight models that can actually run on, on GPUs. So this is very important for a lot of local AI workloads that gamers would have. And presumably it's going to come into play with things like neural rendering features of different kinds. Is that is that kind of along the along lines of your thinking there, Alex? Yeah, that's how I would see it too. And I think this is why they're touting uh, the, the transformer model as being uh, four times as compute laden as before, mm -hmm. uh, because essentially they are going to be able to do more at this lower precision. And Blackwell specifically supporting this will make it as fast as possible for these new models that they're going to be using to accelerate things like DLSS or I presume a, a number of the other neural rendering features, we don't have that de those details at the moment, would also be be leveraging this specific um, format. And with that being said though, this this you'll get the advantages of potentially lower memory usage uh, as well as the speed up on Blackwell, but technically this FP4 could also run on any of the previous architectures too. It just wouldn't have the same level of acceleration, but it could obviously right. have the benefit of lower memory usage. Uh, so that is one of the reasons potentially i mean there's a lot of reasons why there but this could be one of the reasons also why they do actually make mention very specifically of dlss4 having a lower memory usage than in the past for example the frame gen version of it uh but yeah that's something just to talk about that will whether or not uh we see like we don't know the numbers yet and the differences between the performance of the cnn and the transformer model but this could be one of the reasons why blackwell runs that better than the previous generation Right, yeah, that would certainly make a lot of sense. But uh, another key facet of modern graphics rendering is ray tracing, 
And we have a new RT core, which according to NVIDIA is uh, built for mega geometry, which is very enticing. I think you'll agree. And they make some pretty big changes actually to the RT core. Just looking through the slides here, it seems like a more sophisticated, beefier RT core design relative to ETA with, with some new hardware features as well. So could you kind of run through that, Alex? What's what's going on there exactly? So yeah, the, the, the generic thing that they've been doing with each generation of the RT core has been to improve the throughput of the amount of ray box intersections and ray triangle intersections that it can do. It's usually doubled each time. Uh, and this time I believe they are also increasing that, but uh, the largest thing is indeed the hardware support for mega geometry. Now, it's been said to us directly multiple times, as well as in the QA session thereafter, that RTX mega geometry, uh, this new way to essentially uh, rapidly build the acceleration structure uh, without having to do full rebuilds of it constantly with each LOD change, for example, that this is actually supported throughout the entire RTX line of GPUs. It is an API change. It's supported in NV API, etc. But um, I believe very specifically in Blackwell, there are added in hardware units here as it's described to make it faster than it would be on the previous generation. So you get like software support of it on old gen, but hardware support of it on the new gen. And those are two things there. They mention a triangle cluster intersection engine um, mm -hmm. This is basically the way the triangles are going to be batched up and streamed in and out into the acceleration structure, uh, which makes it fast. And apparently they can intersect with it using a specific hardware unit, much like they have a hardware unit that just deals with ray box and ray triangle intersections. So it's like a cluster intersection unit. Another thing that they mention is triangle cluster decompression engine. Now, this is interesting because we don't actually have full details yet as to what how mega geometry very specifically works and i imagine it is done with some form of compression and there's been um research in, into this into the past uh the last uh series of rtx gpus at a lovelace rtx 4000 supported something called a displaced micro maps or dmms and this was uh nvidia's maybe i would say first attempt to try and uh, solve the issue of how do we ray trace against a bunch of bunch of triangles. But if I recall, there was separate research and papers looking into the fact that DMMs were not in their form, at least as initially implemented, weren't very good for like animated geometry. I think there was like issues with seams and things like that, uh, as well as the fact that it wasn't going to be supported by a large breadth of hardware. Uh, this though, in to me, this decompression engine, triangle cluster decompression engine, implies to me that there is something similar going on maybe, but we'll have to see until they release maybe more of the white paper on this, as well as I presume there's gonna be things like uh, demos and things like that because developers will want to learn to mo more about how to use it. But the basic idea is that I'm getting is that um, Blackwell here has hardware for support for something that is going to be done via software in the previous generation, mm -hmm. presumably leading to just it running a good deal faster. Yeah, yeah, certainly still some questions there in particular around that very tantalizing uh, mega geometry demo that we saw a few days ago that was certainly quite compelling, I think you'll agree. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, other, other features here as well. There's a new AI management processor, which to me seems to basically be a response to increasing graphics and non-graphics use of AI in games where you might need to fit a language model in alongside frame generation, super resolution, other AI tasks. Yeah. Um, but they do kind of mention here that it's a bit of a more forward looking aspect of the Blackwell architecture because games that are mixing in a lot of those different kinds of like graphics and non-graphics AI tasks are not terribly common at the moment, um, in part because of the slow speed of game development and also because, uh, which I think we'll return to later, but the consoles aren't really set up to accelerate uh, these tasks, especially with the PlayStation 5. But this is a pretty interesting feature that could pay, pay dividends in some of these more uh, future looking, more advanced kinds of workloads that we might see you know, into the next console generation and things like this, like deep into the future here. Yeah, I think this is more like uh, the the nth the goal nth goal dream stuff that might we heard through the Microsoft leaks of basically uh, uh, an entire Xbox that is dedicated to the largest leap in 
whatever performance in <laughs> console history, which is all about ML performance. And it would be leveraging things like local models to run something we don't, you know, whatever the game developer decides and whatever the research allows by that point in time. Uh, and right now, at least Blackwell is going to be very good at supporting it. The example they gave was basically like a question of latency. Um, you know, the scheduling would allow it so that the, you know, like you had an AI local language model for talking with an NPC character and they, the to get rid of that f weird fourth wall breaking pause every single time you would talk to them, the, the AI, the AMP would essentially schedule that to be hum coming in closer when you activate it. So it wouldn't be, you know, farther behind in latency in the rest of the pipeline. So you wouldn't get as long of a pause. That was the, what they described it as, as like the future concept there. Um, there was like a little bit of demoing of it, but the, the entire gist is that this is not at all something that really is super practical for most recent games, like at least in the next like three years as I see it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a very uh, forward looking technology, but perhaps the technology that's going to mean more to gamers in the here and now and more to their uh, power bills potentially is Max Q, which has basically become, I think, NVIDIA's branding for their various power management techniques and technologies. Um, I do remember that in the past, NVIDIA used to offer laptop parts designated as Max Q, and that was basically their brand for their lower uh, TGP parts there. But um, here it looks like that, you know, that's been over time more broadly applied to their entire product line. And here it looks like they've improved their frequency switching on Blackwell to be more responsive. They've also improved some sleep behavior that might be going on. So can you kind of explain what's going on with Max-Q in Blackwell? Yeah, basically, since they can switch the frequency much more rapidly, uh, it's going to be subframe, I'm pretty sure, uh, uh, at least at reasonable frame rates. <laughs> um, <laughs> that uh, they can essentially turn off more and more parts of the GPU depending upon what is happening in any one given frame or even over multiple frames. Because if you think about it, uh, a GPU is doing a whole bunch of work. A good sum of it is in parallel, you know, with like async compute and stuff and such, uh, as well as, uh, you know, in the past, they've made it so that tensor cores can run or RT workloads can run concurrently with other ones. Uh, but uh, for large portions of a frame, big chunks of the GPU will actually be turned off. And while they do this, what they do is depending upon the amount of time in between some of these things occurring, like they will put that part of the GPU into a lower like power state, sleep state almost, and it'll eventually kind of flatten out at the very bottom if not a lot is occurring. And this allows them to increase versus the previous generation, the amount of power per, I don't know how you would say it, like it's like power for performance yielded, uh, Oliver, like, like efficiency, efficiency. Basically. My brain is yeah <laughs> scattered at the moment. It essentially is improving the efficiency of the chip. Well, which makes sense because they actually, the, 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 the die shrink isn't essentially there to have would have allowed what we would have previously seen, for example, between RTX 3000 and RTX 4000. So they need to come up with smarter, essentially software and hardware based ways on the same, on a relatively same process node to get better uh, efficiency there. And that's one of the ways they're doing it. For the uh, for the desktop chips, this is important, obviously, to lower your power bill, uh, but for it's also extremely important for laptops where uh, you'll have a limited wattage budget there uh, and you kind of want to fit as much in as possible to yield the most amount of performance and battery life possible. So I'd say that's where most users will notice it, but also things like fan speed ramping up, uh, all these things, there's just going to potentially be a good deal better in Blackwell, which is good to see, actually. Yeah, I personally do think that a lot of these uh, technologies are very compelling in particular for laptop users, and we'll touch on this later, but I think DLSS 4 is really going to be quite a defining technology for the more power-constrained and maybe performance-constrained parts in the Blackwell lineup, but we can talk about that in a minute. But there are also some very notable improvements, closing things out here in the display engine, because now it supports DisplayPort 2.1, and also the GPU right. has notably improved hardware video encoding capabilities, especially in the 5090, that top end GPU. So could you kind of walk us through exactly what those changes to the display engine and the uh, video encoders, what would exactly those mean for users? Yeah, so for most users, I'm gonna say actually it's not that huge of a difference. Uh, this mm -hmm. is more orientated 
around creators and video editors and such, or people maybe who use OBS quite a lot for streaming, um, right. having more essentially encode and decode or encoders specifically for the RTX 5090, um, three is mooted there, will allow you to work on multiple streams, uh, for example, in OBS uh, of very high quality streams, for example, and you know having them be encoded in real time or at the end of an export, for example, and just having the export be a lot quicker or have the raw frame rate that you're uploading to Twitch, whatever, uh, be less compromised. So that's essentially it there. I think for most people though, this is just a nice added bonus feature. It won't be too much of a big deal. I think there's other aspects in there like uh, better better quality for bit rate uh, that are mentioned as well as better AV1 ultra high quality support. Uh, but once again, those are, I think most users won't take advantage of that. Uh, I think most people are more interested in things like a DisplayPort 2.1 and PCIe X, you know, 5.0 support. Most games are not saturating PCIe 4.0, but for those <laughs> games in the future where we see uh, a greater interaction between CPU and GPU, which is just inevitable at this point in time, the consoles have right. it way better off there. It's better to be future-proofed as much as possible on something that is so stupidly powerful as an RTX 5090. Because uh, we've seen in the past with games that are limited to 8x lanes, for example, or on motherboards that limit to 3.0, we've seen modern games from the PS5 generation or even PS4 generation, depending on the port, struggling as a result of that. Things like Ghost of Tsushima that I pointed out. And that is a very specific port where they actually emulated like the uh, PS5 API on PC, uh, according to their presentation at the Graphics Developers Conference in the Netherlands. And so any of those type of like strange console porting situations, you always want as much PCIe bandwidth as possible. And, you know, Blackwell's good for it. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, a lot of these changes in particular to the encoding side of things will mostly benefit people working on like video content, like you said. Uh, right now, like a 4090 can do 4K NVENC encodes at about 60 FPS for us uh, and a 5090 maybe right. according to their figures here and according to the rough uh, estimation of how long each would take it probably could do 90 or 100 fps not a gigantic difference but certainly it would speed things up to some substantial degree and it has uh, some implications for those kinds of workloads if you are that kind of power user who wants to encode <laughs> 4k video at a better than real time speeds uh, which is certainly uh, would apply That's to nice, us at least yeah. some of the time 